mobster, professional boxer, celebrity chef, romance author. These are just a few of the words you could use to describe former Food Network personality David Ruggiero, and that's not even his real name. Ruggiero's fall from grace was precipitated by his 1998 arrest on charges of defrauding a credit card company. At the time, he was the owner and head chef of the exclusive French restaurant Le Chanty, where he was accused of inflating customer credit card tips by $190,000. In one instance, the Manhattan District Attorney alleged that Ruggiero had added a $30,000 gratuity to a $1,000 bill. He pleaded guilty to attempted theft in a bid to avoid a 15-year prison sentence. He was successfully forced to pay $100,000 in restitution and undergo five years of probation. Though he avoided jail time, Ruggiero's reputation after the scandal was in tatters. Several years after the scandal, Ruggiero told the New York Times that his previous business partner had saddled the restaurant with enormous tax debts before leaving, and that the credit card fraud had taken place without his knowledge. He explained that after he landed a deal to air his show Little Italy with David Ruggiero on PBS, his sudden fame took a toll. He explained, The next thing I know, I'm involved with five restaurants and I have hundreds of employees. And at the same time, my partnership falls apart in a horrible breakup. Now I'm all by myself, I have five restaurants, I have a book coming out, and a PBS series coming out, and a 42-city tour. Ruggiero to go debuted on Food Network mere weeks before the chef's arrest for credit card fraud, but even though he was found guilty of inflating customer bills, the network was initially reluctant to sever ties. Ruggiero had been their hand-picked follow-up to Emeril Lagasse, whose show Emeril Live had been a resounding hit in 1997. Ruggiero to go, which briefly aired in October 1998, was filmed in front of a live audience. It featured a star-making intro for the chef, with a Seinfeld-esque soundtrack, over which Ruggiero introduced himself as a Brooklyn-born former boxer who dedicated his life to food. Believe it or not, I was a pro boxer for a while, but I decided to trade in my gloves for a set of oven mitts. Food Network gave Ruggiero a primetime slot with daily episodes and invested in heavy marketing. When the budding star was arrested, 12 episodes of Ruggiero to go had already been filmed. This financial commitment was enough to give network heads pause, while Ruggiero's obvious aptitude for the medium likely made it even more difficult to sever ties. The network had a lot riding on the show, but after a few months, even it had to accept the fact that the scandal wasn't going anywhere anytime time soon. They pulled the plug shortly after the arrest. Following the closure of his restaurant and the cancellation of his Food Network show, Ruggiero sought other outlets for his culinary and entrepreneurial skills. First, he forged ahead in the restaurant industry, despite the hit he took to his reputation, opening several establishments on the Upper West Side. Ruggiero opened a Mexican restaurant called Jalapeno, an Italian donut shop called Bomboloni, and a Jewish-style deli known as Lansky's Old World Deli. When the landlord at another location wouldn't let him use gas, he turned it into a sushi restaurant called Sushi A Go Go. At one point, he even co-owned a strip club. Despite Ruggiero's fall from from Greece, these restaurants were largely successful and garnered good reviews. The New York Times described Bomboloni in particular as a bright shop with a well-rounded menu and generous array of fillings for the spherical Italian-style donuts. I take little cultural influences and I let them f sneak their way in. Lansky's was the most successful of the bunch, earning a passionate local following and becoming famous for its matzo ball soup and jackpot sandwich a seven-pound mouth-watering monstrosity containing pastrami, turkey, corned beef, and salami. Even Mad Men actor John Hamm was reportedly a fan of Ruggiero's Deli. Even with decent business and good reviews, none of Ruggiero's culinary ventures lasted. In 2011, Sushi A Go Go was seized by the city marshal for failing to pay taxes. Ruggiero tried to rescue Bomboloni and Jalapeno from a similar fate by filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. At the time, Ruggiero co-owned both establishments, and combined, they were worth less than $500,000. In 2013, a sign on Lansky's door 
Door notified customers that after six years, it can no longer stay in business due to rising costs. That same year, Jalapeno moved into the Lansky's building, but sadly closed a year later. Not long after, Bomboloni also shut its doors. Unlike the sign on the Lansky storefront, which notified customers of the closure and thanked them for their loyalty, Bomboloni displayed a simple for lease notice on its door. Later that year, Ruggiero was arrested for alleged check forgery in a real estate transaction. However, he avoided jail time by pleading guilty to possession of a forged bank instrument. Ruggiero's roller coaster experiences in the hospitality industry pale in comparison to the work he did on the side. In 2022, he opened up to Vanity Fair about the years he spent as a mafia soldier, from the time he was a preteen to shortly after his son died of a drug overdose in 2014. He described becoming a protege of the infamous mafioso Egidio Ernie Boy Honorado at the age of 11 and committing crimes in exchange for big money and a lavish lifestyle. Ruggiero claims that he engaged in loan sharking, truck hijacking, heroin dealing, extortion, torture, and even attempted murder, and that his criminal activity continued throughout his restaurant career. He explained that his entry into the food world was at the behest of his mob boss, who insisted that his soldiers secure legitimate employment to avoid suspicion. Ruggiero's passion for cooking had been fostered by his Italian grandmother, and so he pursued a culinary career even as he continued to work for the family. When Ruggiero stabbed a mugger on the subway, he was charged with attempted murder and sent to Rikers Island. He fled to France to pursue culinary work as soon as he was bailed out. There, he was mentored by some of the best Michelin-starred chefs in the world and brought his newfound expertise back to New York. So it doesn't get hot back there, then you're okay. Well, if it does, we take a little swim. Ruggiero's affiliation with the mob was no accident. As he told Vanity Fair, he is the second cousin of Carlo Gambino, who ran the New York mob for decades and acted as the patriarch of one of the most notorious crime families in the world. Ruggiero's birth name was Sabatino Antonino Gambino, but he changed it when his father was deported to a Sicilian prison and his mother remarried. David was a homage to her favorite movie, David and Lisa, an Oscar-nominated drama about mental illness. Ruggiero was an American approximation of his grandmother's maiden name, Ruggiero. Ruggiero also told Vanity Fair that, as a teenager, he went to Italy to become a formally initiated member of the Mafia. Despite the gravity of this commitment and the years he spent making good on his pledge, Ruggiero turned his back on the mob in 2014 when Daniel Marino, a Mafia boss who Ruggiero had worked for since the 80s, didn't show up to his son's funeral. For Ruggiero, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. He waited seven years to break his silence about his time as a mafioso, but from that moment, he was no longer an active member of the underworld to which he had dedicated so much of his life. Among the vast array of crimes Ruggiero claims to have committed for the Gambino family were several murders. When he was 11, he claims that he watched his mentor beat an informant to death before shooting him and stuffing a bag of cocaine in his mouth. In his 20s, he says he was also forced to participate in the brutal murder of a friend who had fallen in love with a Jewish woman. However, the most high-profile murder Ruggiero admits to having been involved in was the 1978 torture and killing of mobster Pasquale Machirole. The case made headlines when the body was discovered in the trunk of a rental car three weeks later, and Ruggiero was 16 at the time. Killing took a backseat when the young Ruggiero transitioned to cooking, but he still kept up his work for the mob. He told Vanity Fair that the job gave him something that being a chef never could. He explained, I had a terrible need to be wanted and respected, and I never felt like I belonged in the legitimate food world. In the street was where I felt respected. Still, cooking raised his profile among high-ranking members of the family. Even rival gangster John Gotti was susceptible to the glamour and status the chef held. In 1990, Gotti threw his 50th birthday party at one of Ruggiero's restaurants. Just two months later, the mobster was arrested and sentenced to life in prison without parole. 
Following the closure of his restaurants, Ruggiero turned to writing. In addition to publishing several cookbooks, he came out with a gothic horror novel entitled A Wistful Tale of Gods, Men, and Monsters in 2019. The story centers on the small town of Brunswick, New York, which is plagued by the disappearances of small children, a haunted house, a sinister graveyard, and a terrifying monster. In an interview with Books That Make You, Ruggiero said that he began writing to help cope with the death of his son. His second horror novel, A Prison Without Locks, was published in 2020 and is set in another small town where people are disappearing. In this case, the story revolves around a sinister doctor who dabbles with the undead. While someone who's worked in high-stakes restaurants and the mafia writing horror sounds pretty on-brand, you might be surprised to learn that Ruggiero's also written a romance novel. The aspiring author managed to include both crime and romantic passion in his 2020 love story, Say Goodbye and Good Night. Set in Brooklyn in 1977, it follows an aspiring boxer who falls head over heels in love with a young woman during the disco era when the infamous serial killer Son of Sam was taunting New York City police and reporters. Ruggiero explained in a 2020 interview with Book Pleasures that settings and characters from the novel were heavily based on moments and people from his own life. Today, Ruggiero's website details his many writing projects, including novels, cookbooks, and a blog, where he offers reviews of horror movies, recipes, press releases, and stories from his time as a chef. He also has an Instagram page where he posts pictures of his gardening, food, and pets. However, in the last few years, he's also begun producing video content. His YouTube channel has over 6,000 subscribers and provides clips from his 90s PBS and Food Network shows, as well as his appearances on The Today Show and The Cooking Channel. In addition to old clips, he also posts instructional recipe videos and promotional material for his books. Hey. I'm David Ruggiero, and this is another weekly recipe. While his posts have been fairly sporadic over the last few years, it appears that he may be planning to revamp the channel. As of summer 2023, he's begun posting more regularly, and his channel's About page suggests there is even more consistent content to come. If you're thinking that Ruggiero's unconventional life could make a best-selling biography, it seems that the chef has come to the same conclusion. Speaking with Book Pleasures, he explained that a memoir was actually the first thing he produced during the surge of writing he did after his son's death. He confirmed this in a 2018 blog post where he acknowledged that he had a memoir in the works, but that he found great joy in writing horror fiction along the way. The title of the memoir, High Crimes and Haute Cuisine, promises a journey through Ruggiero's dual careers as a chef cooking for the New York City elite and a mobster from one of the most feared crime families in the world. In the author's note of the book, Ruggiero writes, Everything within these pages is accurate. There was no need to embellish. The truths were horrific enough. According to the author, the rights to the book have already been purchased, and a film adaptation is also in the works. 